in the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. That one is so intense, isn't it? It's like, it's like the Gladiator movie. Um, but faith is like that, yes? It's a powerful thing that we have at our disposal. It is a powerful God that we worship and serve. Amen? It's good to be here to say happy Thanksgiving to everybody here in the room and connected to us online. Um, if you were with us last week in worship or if you caught um, the, the service online, um, you may remember that the Valsons, Betty and Gerson, were with us in person. And they have been Foundry's mission partners in Haiti for many years now. Um, they are stateside for a little bit now, a little bit longer, and so it was a blessing to just get to have them be here in person and to pray over them, um, not only for the work that they have done and that they are continuing to do and will continue to do, but also just for their family and for their health and life in general for them. Today, as promised, we are gonna get to hear more of their story. And I know that it will touch you, but I pray that it will also move you and convict you in your own witness as uh, they witness to God's calling and God's faithfulness in their lives. Let's take a look. My name is Gerson Valsin, born and raised in Haiti. Moved to Canada when I was a, almost uh, an adult and at the age of 20. Lived there for 40, 14 years, moved to Texas, stay there, have babies, and moved to Haiti to minister. My name is Betty Valsin born and raised in Haiti, and moved to New York, and met Chassan there, got married in Montreal, and moved to Dallas for study, and have our two daughters, Elizabeth and Deborah Valsen, and then raised them in Haiti, and now they are living in Texas. We have been working in Haiti for 27 years. Haiti is probably one of the most challenging field to work with. But uh, in the last uh, six years, it has been really at the lowest point, starting with COVID in 2020, the country was closed. It's still closed today. All the other countries in the world are open, but Haiti is still closed. Not only closed, but we have to deal now with gangs in Port-au-Prince. 80% of the city is under siege, and uh, we cannot travel outside of the city. We, have, we stay there. So uh, it's a really challenge to f just everyday living to go outside, and you have to watch over your shoulder if the, a bullet is flying or if someone is kidnapping you, or what do you do? We decided to stay there because we felt that, that was our calling to be in Haiti, and especially in this time to be there with the people. All the pastors, most of them, they moved out of the country, and I don't blame them, but we decided to stay. It has been a challenge, but what a blessing it was, and it is, as we see God moving through the church, through our lives, and through the people's life in the church, in the village, great things are going on there. And I will say it is really a good time to be alive as a Christian and to be on the field where we are because God has given us wisdom to know when to go out, <laughs> when to stay home. And Paul in, the, in Ephesians asked us to do the most of the time we have I understand this passage more now than before. 
Before it was just theory. Now I'm living it and I see in uh, challenges, there are great opportunities. And I hope I can share some of those opportunities with you. Uh, we had no choice then to stay because <clears throat> six months before we tried to retire, tried to move to Quebec and just live there. This is a place we used to live. The door was closed and it was clear God wanted us to go back to Haiti. Once we get there, we realized that the church needed a stronger leadership because of the crisis, all of the leaders left the church, left the country. Most of the people that were equipped to do ministry, they left. What do you do? Do you leave the church without leadership and a flock without a shepherd? We said, well, we have to stay. And uh, the most encouraging thing for us, it's on Sunday morning, as the city is closed, everybody is, is living in fear and when we get to church, the people, they come to the only hope they know, which is Christ. And uh, when I see that the first week, the second, the third week, I said, we have to stay. God will do whatever he wants to do with us. We have to stay because there is no other hope. And these people, they are in need of hope. And there is only one hope, which is Christ. The church has grown. As neighborhood after neighborhood are falling to the gangs, people are moving toward our area, and we baptize more people than we <laughs> than before. We more people come to Christ because some of them were in churches where they did not hear the gospel correctly. When they come to our church, they want to get involved. They have to go and hear the gospel and make sure they have made a decision for Christ. We have seen a season of growth like we have never imagined possible. And also, because we stay, that gives respect to the ministry. That gives credibility to, our, to us as ministers of God. People, they see that we are here not because we have something to gain there. We are ready to die or to live, but we are there for them. There is no question they know that God loves them because we stay. This is... Uh, a season of sowing. There is a time for that. It's a time for to sow seeds. And uh, we are looking for the season of really harvesting. But what we see going on now, in spite of the fact that, that the country is going through crises and challenges, we look around. We see churches. The Catholic Church is building bigger churches bigger cathedrals. We see business people building bigger houses, bigger groceries, bigger everything. We said, something is coming. We don't know what it is, but something is coming. And we look around, the evangelical churches, they went away. And uh, I don't see any plan for the future. And I know there is a future that is coming. So we see it as an opportunity. Not only that, we are preparing Jacob's Well to welcome churches in 2026. This year, we will build one of the nicest places to host our teams from the state, looking to make it comfort comfortable for elderly people that will be willing to come because we want to change that valley where we are, and the valley is where everything happens, and we see it. People will come from that valley to reach the neighboring cities and the country. So we see a great future for the gospel and for our ministry. This is the time we, we need friends more than ever, in spite of my age. <laughs> I'm like Caleb. I said, give me that mountain, Lord. Give me that mountain. Give me tools so we can train people and reach the country. God is telling me the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Amen. Faith. 
is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And this is what the ancients were commended for. This is our reading this morning. It's how the 11th chapter of Hebrews begins, and then it goes on to list these faithful ancient witnesses in what we sometimes refer to as the hall of faith. And when I first heard the Valsons' story, and I had heard bits and pieces of it um, as we've kept up with that family and the ministry and the work there. But when I first heard about where they are now and what's going on in their lives, this passage is what immediately came to my mind. And I wanna kinda work, I wanna go through it, just look and listen to what these words say. By faith, The confidence in what we hope for, the assurance about what we do not see. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was made from what is not seen. By faith, confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain, it says. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel speaks still, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. By faith, Noah built an ark in holy fear, warned by things that he had not seen. By faith, hope, confidence in what we hope for, assurance of what we do not see. By faith, Abraham obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And by faith, his wife Sarah, who was past childbearing age, birthed a child because she knew God who made the promise was faithful. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born instead of obeying the king's edict. By faith. Confidence in what we hope for, assurance of what we do not see. Moses, when he had grown up, didn't stay in the home of the Pharaoh where he might enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, but instead joined God's people, kept the Passover, and led God's people through the parted sea and across dry land to freedom. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Listen to these words. The writer goes on. He says, what about Gideon? What about Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets? All these who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice. By faith they shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, turned weakness into strength, became powerful in battle, and routed foreign armies. By faith, friends, by faith. It's quite a testament, isn't it? These words, they are not just words. They are the history of our faith and our church and all of us that are gathered here. We are given this witness and this history to see the way that God's people have been called and the way that they have followed him even when they were not sure of what lay ahead. 
Now, of course, it's not the end of the story, any of these little snippets and any of these characters, is it? We have the blessing of knowing now what the ancients did not know then, that that Christ would come, that the Father would send his one and only Son to die for us, to conquer death that we may live eternally. We know that Christ has died. Christ is risen and Christ will come again. We proclaim it. And because of this, we can have confidence and hope and assurance in what lies ahead even when we cannot see it. And so Hebrews encourages us in our witness It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that has been marked out for us. The writer is saying, y'all, look at all that faith has accomplished Look at all that we are witnesses to. Look at the lives that God has used and the miracles that he has performed. Look at all the ways that he has provided and guided and proved himself over and over and over again. And keep going. Keep going. Hebrews encourages us, run with perseverance. That's an important word to pay attention to there. He doesn't say, run with all the skill, run with all the money, run with all the certainty, run with all the power and all the popularity. What does he say? Run with perseverance. I know the other stuff is way more fun. And it would make the job a whole lot easier. But he says instead, run with perseverance. Don't be deterred. Do not be distracted. Run. And so we do by faith. The anthem that repeats itself all through this passage, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses, by faith, the ancients, Y'all, that's still the anthem repeating in this church today, isn't it? By faith, confidence in what we hope for and assurance in what we do not see. By faith, the Valsons moved back to Haiti. Amidst darkness and opposition, by faith, They have carried the light of Jesus into homes and into communities. By faith, they have stepped in to what they could not see and trusted the one who can. By faith, the same God that has called them to Haiti is moving in the hearts and the lives of us gathered here, in this room, in this family of faith. By faith, by the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see, we have prayed, we have trusted, we have persevered, we have stood in the gap about what is happening on an island that many of us may never step foot on, though I know that many in this room have. Y'all, by faith, by faith, we stand together now as a great cloud of witnesses to proclaim the goodness of God And not just what we know, what we read, and what we see in this glorious gift of his word and scripture, but to proclaim the goodness of what we haven't seen yet, what we can't even imagine, but that which we know is a reality 
that which we follow Jesus into, that which we are called to share with the world around us. All of this, friends, by faith, because we have a hope in something greater than ourselves, and we have an assurance that he who has promised is faithful. You know what struck me the most when I was listening to Gerson's testimony? is um, how much and how many times he talks about seeing a future when others could not see it. How they stayed when others left because they knew that people there needed hope and the hope of Jesus Christ. He says that them being there, that, that others are able to see that it is not about personal gain, but the chance to just stand up for the credibility of their ministry and their faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gerson, as some of you may know, has been on our prayer list because he is currently undergoing treatment for cancer. And yet, even in this season of challenge, what is God telling him? The best is yet to come. Isn't that the great irony of witnessing? That in knowing and following and sharing and trusting and obeying and all of these things that we are called to, God never calls us to see. He does not stand before us with a crystal ball and tell us how all of the things are going to turn out. And you know, I'm going to level with you. If that seems hard or harder on some days than others, well, it is. And so we ask, then how do we do that? I mean, how, does Gerson have some, and Betty, do they have like supernatural powers? It's community. I don't think we can do it on our own. And if you ask the Valsons, they will tell you, you cannot do it on your own. That's why Hebrews calls us together as a great cloud of witnesses. When I think about the Valson story and I think about Foundry story and I think about the story of my own life, y'all, we cannot overlook or underestimate the blessing and the value of community. We read this, this text about these heroes of the faith, what happened to them in their time. And it says, Luis read the passage for us at the end of that passage, these were all commended for their faith. And yet none of them received what had been promised. Well, that's not very encouraging, is it? But it continues on. Since God had planned something, what? Better for us. So that only together with us would they be made perfect. Think about that for a minute. Only together with us would they be made perfect. Your story, my story, God's plan for all of us. Y'all, it began way long ago, and it continues still. God's plan is not for just an individual. Does God see us? Yes. Does he hear us? Yes. Does he know every fiber of our being and every thought in our mind and our heart? Yes. And we may all be at different places in our faith and in our walk with Christ. We may be at different places in our discipleship journey. But God's provision for us happens so largely in the context of community. God's plan for us is the body of Christ. How else, how else do we walk through life? How else do we handle the things that we cannot see? How else do we endure doubt and struggle and hardship and the unknown and the unforeseen? How did the ancients do it? How have the Valsons done it if not together? 
And Paul is writing his letter to the church at Philippi. It's, a, it's just four quick chapters, and yet in, those, that, in that book, he talks about joy and rejoicing over and over and over again, which is funny because he also talks a lot about chains and prison. And so how do the two come together? Well, look here, what he says at verse 119. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. He continues at chapter two. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness, compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mine. See, joy, Paul is saying that our joy, our ability to rejoice, our ability to persevere, to run the race marked out for us comes from our community, from our connection to one another through Jesus Christ. This is where our joy comes from. We have our witnesses and your witness and my witness. Y'all, they are precious and they are necessary. Your testimony of faith, the things that you know of God, the way that you have seen him work in your life, the things that you can see because you have confidence and hope and assurance in the things that you do not see, y'all, Your witness may be a lifeline for somebody else. I want to encourage you in that. Someone you know is walking in darkness. And God has given you a way to bring light and truth to that person. It may be resources. It may be time. It may be a word of testimony. We have this Advent calendar coming up, and it's it's a great challenge, and it's a great tangible way to share the wonder of Christ in so many different ways with people. Gerson mentioned they are opening Haiti back up, and in 2026, they'll be welcoming mission teams again. There are opportunities upon opportunity upon opportunity. And maybe it's just something that you do here or in your community or in your home or in your neighborhood. But in pouring out blessing, this is how we, in turn, are blessed. And this is the great encouragement of our faith, that by faith, We are led by faith. This community edifies us, encourages us, disciples us. God has planned something great for us. And together we will be perfected in it. By faith, together we will be witnesses of hope. We will be confident and assured of God's goodness. By faith, We will rejoice knowing that he who has promised is faithful. Friends, when you are gathered around your Thanksgiving table this week or you are traveling to see family, the best is yet to come. What a thing to give thanks for. The best is yet to come. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, not just because it is the season for it, but Lord, because your faithfulness is just all around us. Lord, we lift up Gerson and Betty to you and to the ministry that they are leading there, Lord. We lift up their bodies to you and their health, and we ask for your blessing to continue that those seeds that they are planting now, Lord, that 
Maybe they won't see them be harvested in their lifetime. But we praise you because we know that you are working for something greater. Lord, I pray for how we can be a part of that. Not just the ministry in Haiti. But Lord, what are you saying to us today? What do you need to say to us gathered as a community, but also to us individually in our lives to show us that something is coming? That the best is yet to come. That whatever your goodness has accomplished up to this point, Lord, by faith we know that it is not finished. By faith we know that you have drawn us together, God. So give us Give us a word how we might step in with confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we cannot see. Give us a word as to how we might step in to that great cloud of witnesses and be part of the something greater that you are doing and that is still to come. Lord, I ask for encouragement over my brothers and my sisters here in this room and I ask for encouragement of myself that when it feels too hard and it feels too wearying and it feels too dark, Lord, that you will make a way. Because by faith we know that you always have. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, let us stand and raise our voices and thanks to God.